Dear students, welcome to a corona-free classroom. I'm here not only to entertain you, but also to educate you and coach you about economics, finance, and entrepreneurship. As you prepare for this lecture, please log in to Blackboard for course PowerPoints and other resources. You can pause the video by clicking somewhere down here and grab the material you might need for the upcoming lecture. See you all after the pause. Ta-da! Welcome to MIB 540 International Finance. Before we start, I would like to remind you that the syllabus, PowerPoint, and other important documentations are uploaded to Blackboard. Now, let's start Chapter 1. International finance is exciting because we have expanded opportunities with globalization. It's not only the joy of experiencing different cultures, geographical areas, or philosophical ideas, but also the challenging aspects of culture shocks, disease, and awkward bureaucracy that some countries have. A glimpse of what inspired different cultures can be found in the book The Worldly Philosophers. These political economists have influenced how we operate our nation states. The book is not only about macroeconomics, but also covers the quirky and fun personalities of these individuals. So it's one of my easy to read book recommendations for you. So what's so special about international finance? Top of mind might be foreign exchange rates or political risks. If the exchange rate is very low for one country, it makes goods and services really cheap in that place. And naturally, governments regulate how goods and services, capital and people are allowed to move. One of the cornerstones for the European Union, for example, is a free flow of people, capital, goods and services. In one way, it could be seen as a freedom-loving project. Because if you do business with your neighbors, you're probably not going to go to war with them. Other important parts of international finance is market imperfections. Laws and the administrative code are sometimes very different. They might change and they can be outright challenging. For a business point of view, the expanded opportunity sets are amazing. It allows companies to do foreign direct investments in a different culture, a different country, and build factories there and create jobs in that area and hire people at a much lower cost, building really interesting good products that they can then import to another country. Naturally, it adds transaction costs, shipping, and insurance costs that might be slightly different, but there's companies that specialize in that, and that is what we're going to learn in this class. One thing to pay attention to is that a lot of books, especially educational books, do not list when you read economic books especially if they're academic in nature you have to pay attention to that some series assume certain things and some of those things that are assumed is that there's no taxes all decisions are rational prices are fair there's equal opportunities everywhere and all the laws are similar and naturally, everyone likes, wants, and needs the same thing. This picture illustrates some of the very complex parts of international finance. The world has lots of different cultures. Some value individualism. Others value collectivism. Some are very strong in ethnocentrism. And any time you travel somewhere else, you have to deal with culture shock, the languages might be similar or really, really different. The social structure, 
or even the class system. It's all different and it makes us all unique culture to culture. The culture inspires political philosophy. It explains whether or not you value capitalism or communism, socialism, national socialism, sometimes called state capitalism today, or you have a religious authority that controls how the nation operates. The political philosophy will govern how we draft our constitutions. That's the law of the game. You have to know the rules in the business that you're entering or the business sector that you are engaged in. If you don't know the rules, you can't really play. You can definitely not play to win. If you do win, it's because your opponent is simply playing the game worse than you are. Just think about football or soccer. Everyone has the same set of rules to play that game. Now, it's the strategy that determines whether or not you will succeed and win. Now, it's slightly different when it comes to business because you don't want to win-lose most of the time. You want to make sure it's a win-win situation. So if you don't know the rules of the game, things might not turn out so well for you. There are some general ideas of how laws are divided up. One is natural law. Natural law is all the types of laws that we can all agree upon. We could, for example, go to Mars and meet all these Martians, and we can probably agree upon the same types of laws, like you should not steal from other people, or you should not kill anyone. That's an example of natural law. We can always agree upon that. Common law is more of a tradition. It really comes from the customs of the United Kingdom and it was exported to all of its colonies. So uh, an area that has common law would be like the United States, South Africa, and um, for example, Australia. Civil law is a set of codes, the way it's structured. And um, an example of that would be like Germany, France, Japan, and Russia. They're very similar on how laws are structured. Where common law might say, uh, smoking um, crack cocaine is illegal. But civil law might say, smoking substances that are controlling or altering your mindset are illegal. Theocratic law is when you follow religious scripts very closely. Iran is a good example of that today. Sometimes we can't agree upon things and that's why we have arbitrage laws. These are typically volunteer ways of solving disputes. The United Nations have a convention how arbitrage rules should be handled and how contracts should uh, work across borders. So a company might have arbitrage rules uh, in their contracts that if we have a dispute, we will meet, for example, in Stockholm, Sweden, and solve our disputes right there. That means that the parties from, for example, uh, China and the United States will meet in Stockholm, Sweden and solve their indifferences and have the judges at that location look at who is right, who is wrong, what is not going so well and how should we solve this opportunity and hopefully it's a good, well-drafted negotiation on how to solve the dispute. International finance can be a wonderful tool for global peace. So let's just think about the words, we the people, and the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. By respecting people and other nations, we can achieve peace, humanity, and freedom. International trade can offer a strong sense of independence 
and allow a nation state to be prosperous and allow its people to have freedom of choice. If a nation runs its business on a macro point of view in a way that it offers uh, equal trade balance with its partners, it will result in a win-win situation where both cultures can flourish and go totally nuts in all the wonderful ideas that they might have. I believe that Maslow's hierarchy of needs is an important theory that should be used in business. It would help a business to decide how to use its scarce resources or what sector to engage in. Sometimes we have a wonderful, awesome, good time and we can do all kinds of fun things where we focus on our interests and creative talents. But other times we might have a disaster. Maybe it's local, maybe it's global, like a pandemic. So when things change, we might go from having really strong safety needs to actually being able to go to the museum and enjoy the arts. All countries are not equal when it comes to the number of citizens, their rules, what kind of natural resources they might have. As a result, they need to focus on how to handle their scarce resources. And that might mean that they might have to put in place some sort of price ceiling or a price floor. It is easy from an academic point of view to say that if you do this, then that will happen. If the free markets are allowed to operate without a bunch of uh, government um, regulation and interference, Typically what happens is that price will try to go down and as a result, the quantity consumed will go up. That's why we outsource stuff to other countries because we can then indirectly lower the cost of production while producing much more. And that's part of the idea of the consumption driven economy. Globalization is a process by which regional economies, societies, and cultures have become integrated through a global network of communication, transportation, and trade. Multinational firms are the organizations that produce goods or services in more than one country. During World War II, the United States, England, France, and Russia worked on a lot of activities how to shape the post-war world. It resulted in the Bretton Woods agreement for how currencies should be stable, what kind of reparations that will be put in place by the victors. But one really important part was a general agreement on tariffs and trade, also known as GATT, in 1947. The goal was to reduce tariffs and decide what should be a duty-free product. What should be the general price level for agriculture, services, banking, insurance, intellectual properties, and so on. It later became the World Trade Organization. If we consider exchange rates between the US dollar and euros. If the euro is really strong and the US dollar is really weak, then it makes sense for Europeans to buy stuff in the United States because their currency is strong and import it over to the European Union. Now, on the other hand, if the European currency, the euro, is not so strong at the moment, then it makes sense for us in the United States to buy things from Europe. The tides between the currencies 
float back and forth and results in opportunities for international trade. Comparative advantage is very challenging today. When David Ricardo came up with the idea in 1817, he was merely looking in between two countries, and that's what we've been taught to this day. The general idea is that if two countries engage in trade with each other and they decide to actually focus on their strengths, that is, what do they have an advantage of when it comes to production? So if England would focus on kidney pie, they would export kidney pie to France. And France would focus on, for example, wine and export that to England. And by doing so, both societies can enjoy more kidney pie and more wine compared to if they decided to actually do it on their own. So here's an example about intellectual property. Assume that Apple is planning and building and designing and creating the intellectual property for a really cool cell phone in the United States. They would take that intellectual property and have it manufactured, for example, in China. China would then build this iPhone, add a little bit of profit margin, and export it back to the United States. And as a result, we would then pay the Chinese money to do that for us. At this point, the Chinese have a bunch of U.S. dollars, and they have to decide what to do with that. The Chinese can decide to use the U.S. dollars as a reserve currency. They can decide to sell the currency and buy euros and buy BMWs, for example. They can also use it the US dollars to buy stocks, bonds, or commodities, or oil. Sometimes the Chinese would say, there are some cool things that we would like to spend our money, our US dollars, in the United States. They might come here as tourists and go to Disneyland, or they might buy Harley Davidson motorcycles from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Sometimes they might do the most beautiful thing for us in the United States, and that's engage in foreign direct investments. They will do a greenfield project, as it's called, where they will say, you know what? We don't want to ship things from the China to the United States, so we're going to actually build a factory in the United States so we can serve our customers better. All these decisions are very important, not only for an individual or a business, but more so from a national macroeconomic point of view. And in some cases, the Chinese might not use their U.S. dollars to buy goods and services from the United States, but rather use those U.S. dollars to trade with a different country. And that way, the money does not naturally flow back to the United States as we might have expected. The rules of the game is different for each nation state. Some countries value shareholder theory and others will value stakeholder theories. What's right or wrong depends on what they really value. The idea is how do you best maximize corporate value? Typically we get new laws after some sort of disaster, like the crash of 1929. That's when we had got and received the Bank Act of 1933 that established the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, FDIC, and also a very important rule that was called Glass-Eagle Act. It controlled the banks and how they were allowed to use money. They wanted to stop and control speculation. Glass-Eagle Act was repealed in 1999 under President Clinton. In fact, the banks had actually asked to repeal it many years before. Many years ago, the banks went to Jimmy Carter and said, we are so sophisticated today that we should really repeal Glass-Eagle and uh, let us do our thing. We know what we're doing. Well, Jimmy Carter said no. 
Later, the banks would go to Ronald Reagan, who also said, no way, I lived through World War II. I lived through the Depression. I will not accept that to happen again. When the banks went to George W. Bush, he simply said, uh-uh. Well, President Bill Clinton was from a totally different generation. I'm sure the banks went and nagged on him year after year after year. And finally, before he gave up his seat as President of the United States, he accepted the bank's idea of repealing the Glass-Steagall Act in 1999. It took the banks less than eight years to blow up the banking system with the crash that started in 2007 and it got accelerated in 2008 with a big disaster after that. A big part of why banks wanted to have this repealed was that they felt that the corporate governance was very strong. And that's the relationship between shareholders and the firm's management team. We have since then uh, received um, new sweeping regulations with Sarbanes-Oxley in 2002 and later Dodd-Frank Act in 2010. The reason why we got Sarbanes-Oxley and Dodd-Frank was because of corporate greed, mismanagement, and other immoral decisions. Just because something is legal doesn't mean that we should actually do it. Since the Great Recession, society, its consumers, and businesses have turned to sustainability in the way we do business. We focus more on fair trade. Environmental corporate governance, or ESG, or socially responsible investing, SRI, has become more popular, more important, and a new direction for how we should conduct our affairs. There are many cultural differences on ownership. Australia, England, Canada, and the United States tend to believe that maximizing shareholder value is the way to go. Germany, France, and Scandinavia, they believe maximizing stakeholder value is the best way of conducting their affairs. The businesses are very much engaged in the well-being of not only employees and customers, but also their suppliers or banks and naturally the shareholders. Japan believes that maximizing the value of the firm's immediately family of businesses, such as suppliers, banks, customers, and so on, in a way of, I believe is pronounced Kiritsu, is intended to enrich the local community. Now the question is, what is too big to fail? Sherman's Antitrust Act of 1890, that's a long time ago. The Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 was a federal statute which prohibits activities that restrict interstate commerce and competition in the marketplace. So that meant if you were too big in the United States and you prevented other companies from competing with you, you were seen as too big and you needed to break up your organization. I would argue that if you're too big to fail, maybe it's the best interest of society as a whole to actually split up the organization into smaller pieces so that the damage is not so huge in case of financial distress. It's not correct that the taxpayer should bail out large businesses, especially if the taxpayer does not reap the rewards of success of that one business. So I believe it's a natural way to go for society as whole 
to engage more in a shareholder value situation. To better understand how a business is managed and operated, it's important to understand the documents that controls it. Shareholder agreements are the set of documentation that control items such as how do you elect the board of directors to represent the shareholders. Another part is how do you submit a shareholder resolution. All these things are typically listed in the Articles of Incorporation, bylaws, and other policies. So the shareholders elect the board of directors that hire the CEO, the CFO, the COO, and so on. And each of the layers under the CEO will hire the next layer. The larger the organization, the more layers are involved in the hiring process. And that's why it can take so much time. The management has a fiduciary responsibility for its shareholders and stakeholders. And when they actually fail for various reasons, there's different ways to solve that in the United States. One is a Chapter 11 reconstructing, and the other is a Chapter 7 liquidation. Europeans typically freak out because they don't see the difference between a Chapter 11 and a Chapter 7. They typically assume that it's a liquidation. They're bankrupt. They're gone. They're dead. But in capitalism, we don't want to kill something if we can save it. But an important part to pay attention to is the liabilities, such as taxes, pensions, debtors, vendors, employees, shareholders, and so on. In other countries, the shareholders might have a very limited amount of power. For example, Brazil, India, Russia, China, Indonesia, Korea, and so on, they don't have very strong shareholder relationships. As a result, conflict of interest often happens. As always, I would like to remind you to observe the voluntary quarantine and do your part in stopping the coronavirus and keeping yourself and your loved ones safe. Until next time, Please do the homework listed somewhere on the screen. Email me your work at your earliest convenience. You can also email me anytime you want if you have any questions. I will also email you an invite to our next virtual classroom via Blackboard. It has been swell teaching you online today, but after all, it's said and done. More is actually said than done. So pull up your sleeves and do the work. Get your homework done, email me, and you'll earn the grade. That easy. Well, that's all, folks. See you all soon. Ta-da. Goodbye.